Okay, y'all, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Welcome, thanks for being here this morning. Uh, I am incredibly excited about uh, this training session, so thank you for being here. A um, couple housekeeping notes. Uh, number one, the office uh, is reopened today, so feel free to um, stop by. We just ask that you wear masks inside and get a temperature check at the front desk. Um, and then uh, tomorrow's training is uh, again at nine, and uh, we are having a panel of our agents talk about dumpster fire uh, transactions. So hope you can join us for that. Um, another one that I really want everyone to get on their calendars um, um, would be um, next Thursday. Uh, the folks from Child Advocates will be joining us to do their Interrupting Racism program. Um, originally, that was going to be a person, but we went ahead and moved it virtual, so um, it'll be on Zoom. Uh, the timing is a little different on that one. It's from 10 a.m. to 12, um, but I think that's going to be incredible. We um, have been trying to book them uh, to come and speak with us for about a year and a half now, um, and it just, timing hasn't worked out, and then COVID, and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, um, if you can, please try to make it to that. But um, without further ado, I am going to pass it over uh, to Jordan Ryan. Jordan is with uh, the Indiana Historical Society, um, and I don't really know anything else to intro her by, so I'm going to let her uh, tell about herself. But Jordan, thank you so much for being here. Um, share privileges are turned on, so you should be good to go. All right, thanks. Thanks, Rosine. Thanks, everyone, for joining us like the morning after the election. This when we picked this date, I don't even think I was thinking about how long we would all be up all night worrying. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Oh, I missed the election. Yeah, true. Uh, all right. How does that look, Rosie? Cool. All right. Thanks. Um, so my goal of this presentation is to just bring up some questions and highlight some resources that help us think about, you know, policy related to housing and how that policy erases and also reshapes parts of our city. Um, thinking about concepts like planning and zoning and land use, how they intersect with housing and transit and commerce and things like that. And I want you to you know, question how decisions that are made 50, 100, you know, 150 years ago, how they really do greatly impact how we navigate the city today, where we live, where some of us can live, um, how we get to work, what and how many amenities we have access to, things like that. And I think um, if there's like a central thesis to this, it's really understanding how the way we move through the city is entirely predicated on like this accumulation of historic decisions um, that were made, you know, before we were all born. So a little bit about me. I think it's important to sort of own your bias and your perspective and talk about your positionality kind of more on the um, academic history side of things. Uh, but I am a practicing public historian. Um, I have experience working in historic preservation and um, a lot of my work has to do with sort of city urban planning and uh, different marginalized voices and sprinkle in a little bit of digital humanities work. So I do a lot of mapping and uh, data and playing with GIS. Uh, I've, I've spent the last decade or so working in libraries and archives and I also have some experience doing community advocacy work on the southeast side. Um, a lot of that tends to be neighborhood-based um, in the Fountain Square area. A lot of work with Rethink 6570, um, affordable housing, community land trusts, things like that. So in conclusion, I'm, I'm queer and angry and I'm a big accomplice to fighting white supremacy capitalism. And then um, some of these questions are sort of my bigger professional questions that are always sort of lingering in my head as I do my work. So day to day, you know, I'm, I'm processing, I'm archiving materials related to architectural collections. Um, so these tend to be, you know, blueprint drawings and building specs and um, photo documentation. So I'm always thinking about how these things help us 
visualize different policies um, because sometimes you kind of have to read between the lines when you're looking at archival materials. Um, so, you know, I do spend a lot of time helping developers and homeowners and, uh, you know, preservation architects um, look at some historic documentation to do adaptive reuse projects or just historic rehab projects or um, homeowners are trying to figure out, you know, what something used to look like in their home um, before they begin a project. Uh, but part of my brain is always sort of thinking more on that um, sort of academic kind of high level uh, policy and how can we sort of teach people looking through archival materials like this, you know, this is an example of, of this disinvestment or this inequity. Um, so I spend a lot of time thinking about things like that. So a little bit about why I'm doing this. Uh, so part of my job as the architectural archivist for the Indiana Historical Society has been developing this bicentennial collecting initiative. And that was an initiative to really boost our Indianapolis holdings. Um, so we decided two and a half years ago that we were gonna launch an exhibit this year on Indianapolis and the Bicentennial, and it was going to be sort of neighborhood-based and community-based, um, but we didn't have necessarily the most robust holdings. Um, we don't have a city archive like a lot of major U.S. cities do. Um, usually your archive for the city kind of lives in your public library system, but our pub public library decided not to be an official archive many, many decades ago. Um, so you just have the stuff kind of floating throughout the city county building. Um, you have stuff, you know, in warehouses and people's garages and attics. Um, so how do you sort of capture all that so that you can like build the best exhibit you can? Um, so that's what I've been doing for the last two and a half years is sort of going through our backlog, working with the city, working with different community groups and filling the gaps in the archive, you know, playing with different archival materials and thinking about like the best stuff to highlight for the exhibit and how we can you know, use that stuff for programming like this, um, programming coming up that I'll plug at the end of the talk. And of course, you know, the exhibit itself, which is up and you can, you can go into the History Center and check it out if you'd like. So as I was working on this project, um, you know, I wanna highlight the best and I want to talk about the things that make the city great but if I'm only doing that that I'm failing as an archivist it's my job to show sort of all sides of the spectrum because in 50 years and 100 years a historian's going to be in the archive and you know we can't make it look like everything was just perfect right now because it's not <laughs> we know that um, so how do I prevent myself from being a city booster and sort of show all perspectives. And that's where you get into all these sort of critical and countercultural narratives. Um, so this is one example of one of my favorite things we uncovered in this whole process, which is this pamphlet called Indianapolis Downtown Development for Whom. And it's super critical. Um, most of the people that wrote this that had city jobs lost their city jobs after this came out. I think this is published in like 79. So this is really a critique of Unigov and how Unigov taxing policy sort of redistributed wealth. And if you look at the, the image, the illustration, you see like this guy, it says major corporations, banks and insurance companies, and he's like holding money. And like the, the puppet with the sort of, it's dying, it says neighborhoods near North Side, Fountain Square, near East Side, Hawville. And like you all as real estate agents are probably like, yeah, like those neighborhoods were struggling for a while. So like, I think that there's some really legitimate threads here when we think about history and planning and land use and housing. And so that's sort of what started my redlining thoughts. Um, so what is redlining? Uh, my definition is that it's a discriminatory practice by which banks and mortgage lenders and insurance companies refused or limited loans, mortgages and insurance within specific geographic areas. And this is particularly in older and inner city neighborhoods to non-white and or low income families by the guidance of the Federal Housing Administration's Homeowners Loan Corporation, which you see a lot is just HLC. And this was in 1937 here in Indianapolis. So in addition to that, realtors and real estate developers 
misrepresent markets and discriminate against prospective home buyers, and that's sort of a ploy to control market values. So you're you're sort of seeing it at all levels of of the home buying, you know, steps. Um, there's like this this misrepresentation and this inequity happening, and um, the HLC is putting a value statement on neighborhoods. So that's what you see here on this redlining map. Uh, so the the color system is green is best, blue is still desirable, yellow is definitely declining, and red is hazardous. So this redlining system, um, you know, it, it created a cultural and financial dynamics that favor white home buyers while creating creating an adverse effect for racially oppressed people, particularly black families. And we're we're living with that today. If you want to play with this map and zoom in and out, I have the link posted at the bottom. Um, you can also just put in search mapping inequality and I can send Rosie all my links after the talk. So in tandem with the map are these forms and they're called area description forms. And that's really um, the more fascinating part I think that you all would find fascinating is how the HOLC is devaluing these neighborhoods. Like what are sort of the, the minus ones? What are the, the negative points that they're giving to these neighborhoods in the 30s, right? So here's an example of, of one of the Indianapolis sheets. And I've zoomed in on some remarks, um, but there's a lot of different reasons that HOLC was devaluing certain neighborhoods. Um, so it included the type of resident. So this tends to be race, but it's also nationality, also immigration status. It can also be for the buildings, for the structures themselves. So the type of housing, um, I mean like single family home versus you know duplex or apartment, the age of the house and the materiality. And then there's other factors that you can sort of read between the lines here I'm looking at market values and assessment trends, but also like proximity to floodplains and industry come up. Um, but I think generally, you know, a lot of times it has to do with the type of resident and the buildings themselves. So like here is the Northeast side and in the bottom section of that page, you know, they still redline this area, but they're saying around Douglas Park are a better class Negro. And that comes up all the time. So here are more examples from Indianapolis. Um, you know, we've got the Northwest side They're saying detrimental influences, age, almost solid Negro, industrial. Um, we have another one on the North side, the age and inhabitants. Um, and then Northeast Central. Um, I thought this one was fascinating because it wasn't about people. You know, this was all about sort of the built environment, very old. Some remodeled into cheap apartments and rooming houses. Part is factory district. So we've got all these, you know, different ways to devalue, right? Downtown. And if I go back to the map, uh oh, it's thinking, there we go. You can see like the whole sort of city core, you know, basically center township ish is almost all devalued into that third or fourth grade, you know, the declining or hazardous, you know, you see the the yellow and the red and then there's, you don't start to see blue and green until you get out to like those first wave of what we think of as like early suburbs. Um, the streetcar suburbs, you know, you got Irvington on the east side, you, you know, you can see a little bit in uh, Garfield Park on the south side and then on the north side, you do have that really strong corridor kind of in the Butler Tarkington area and heading north. So this has an effect, you know, decades and decades later, we're still talking about this. Here are some headlines of, of many, you know, in the news. I'm sure you've seen stuff like this. Um, the consequences of redlining are so expansive, right? And they're compounded by numerous inequitable housing and development policies um, that are enacted at all levels of government. You know, we're seeing some federal policy. We see um, stuff on the state level, you know, like the state preemptively banning the city, you know, putting inclusionary zoning banning laws on the books, but then we also have policies at the local level. Um, so it's, it's quite the struggle. And we can sort of follow this origin of redlining 
and then later inequitable sort of policies. And you can see this relation to things like racial wealth gaps and declining home ownership rates, the you know, upcoming eviction and foreclosure crisis that we've been talking about for a while. Um, things that are a little less you know, data centric, but still pretty obvious things like neighborhood disinvestment, you know, infrastructure challenges. We're always struggling you know, with our streetlights and our roads and our sidewalks. Um, and then just you know, sort of greater quality of life issues in a lot of these neighborhoods. But I do think we're able to document some of this change over time through these archival collections, um, through things like historic photographs and planning maps and documentation and resident oral histories, letters, you know, things like that. So we can sort of look at these things and then it's my job as the archivist to like show policymakers and advocates and people who are really, you know, in the trenches today fighting for change, like show them this stuff um, so that we can we can do something about it. But obviously there's still, you know, so much work and scholarship to be done as we move forward. So a few areas of town where we can sort of do a, a comparison of um, pre-redlining and post and sort of how these areas change over time. I wanna bring to your attention sort of the 400 to 800 blocks of Indiana Avenue. So that main diagonal straight you see here in this base map. So this is from 1916. And think about sort of the density you see of this base map. Um, we have a lot of uniform blocks full of these little structures. You can see sort of near the southern end. I don't know if you can actually see my cursor, but I'm sort of, okay. Um, so near the southern end, you see more of these like red or pink little squares. Um, so these are showing brick structures that tend to be commercial buildings and stores. And then near the northern end of Indiana Avenue, we have more yellow structures. So this tends to be wood frame and residential. But it's like really dense, right? This whole area it looks um, really developed. You know, not a lot of parking lots, not a lot of open spaces. So you know that there's a lot of people there. Um, so, you know, the, the caveat here is that we do put a lot of blame on IUPUI um, for sort of this area changing over time, um, but you're going to see this large displacement wave and sort of demolition of a lot of these structures um, from other sources, you know, including the city um, redeveloping the Central Business District, you know, just 50 years later, sort of in the UNIGOV era, but then also, you know, the state government is going to start chipping away on the southern end as they expand their parking lots. So if we zoom in, this is part of that last map, and this is showing you Lockfield Gardens area. So we're right off Indiana Avenue. We're in the IUPUI neighborhood at this point, you know, pre-IUPUI. And I want to point out this neighborhood um, that is, is there before Lockfield Gardens, our first public housing project. Um, so this is the same 1916 map. The area I have sort of drawn in here with this line is bounded by Indiana Avenue to the north, Lock Street to the west, North Street to the south, and then Blake Street to the east. And in our collection, we had this architectural model that I'm showing you here on the left, um, which is someone took the time to document with like little wooden blocks what the neighborhood looked like prior to the mass demolition of this entire space to be reconfigured for Lockfield Gardens, um, which I, you know, any architectural model is going to be like relatively cool to me, but this one is so neat because it's giving you more of a sense of like space and massing and density than you could get from like a map or a photograph, right? And you'll never see anything like this. And, you know, this is a shameless plug that I, I did get this model in the Bicentennial exhibit, so you can see it in person if you go to IHS to check out the exhibit. But again, this is just showing you that this area is like super densely populated with lots of structures, um, but we see that it's, it's redlined, right? Just two decades later. And so what happens is during the time that this area is devalued and all of these buildings are demolished and all the people are displaced, we have a complete reconfiguration of this, this many acres of land. Um, so here I'm layering the architectural model with the 
um, sort of rendering the site plan for Lockfield Gardens. So they, they demo all these structures, they build these new apartments as part of, um, it's like an early urban renewal plan. Um, and it, this gives you a better sense of sort of the, the way they reconfigured the space. That empty block right here on the left is the only thing that stayed from, from before is the school. Um, so that's where that goes. So we're seeing, you know, this is, this is complicated just 50 years later because then IUPUI comes in and demolishes half of this project um, for their uh, sort of a street reconfiguration. And then they claim they want to build more apartments um, to help with the Pan Am games in 1987, but it ends up being student housing. So this all brings me to sort of the next wave of redlining, which is if redlining happens first, it's sort of, um, I guess the second thesis would be uh, gentrification is sort of like the end game of redlining, um, but it doesn't just happen overnight. It doesn't happen in one year. It happens with numerous policies over many, many decades. So what we see not even a decade later is that building on redlining, the federal government takes a new strategy, which is urban renewal, which I sort of just teased at um, with the, the Lockfield site. So urban renewal is part of this plan in the post redlining federal housing um, sort of think tank, which is they're thinking about things like cities and how cities are aging and are they overcrowded? You know, I don't know if they're really overcrowded. I think they just probably weren't planned for the right kind of density, but in their minds, cities are overcrowded, they're dirty, you know, housing stock is old, every, poor conditions. So this is where you start seeing that phrase slum clearance a lot. Um, so they want, the federal government wants to clear slum areas and redevelop. There's a lot of funding. Um, Indianapolis is kind of weird that we, we don't always take all the federal funds um, that are available, if not at all. Um, so in some ways we have less urban renewal damage than other cities, sort of sister cities to us. Um, so we ultimately only select six sites for urban renewal. And these, um, these six sites are mapped here. They're all sort of on the north side of downtown, but all in center township. And at this time, um, the idea is we're going to take federal money, we're going to do these mass demolitions, we're going to rebuild spaces um, so that things like the GI Bill and early suburbanization trends and automobile culture, all these things that are happening in the 1940s, there's, there's space to rebuild. You know, we're building roads to get to these new early suburbs. Um, we're just, we're going to clean up sort of this the city center but it doesn't always happen that way and we see a lot of people get displaced we see a lot of urban renewal areas are completely re-transformed into into other sort of spaces and um, we know what's inevitable which is that people continue to sort of move outside of the city center so these spaces um that are urban renewal sites, three of them are all along that sort of cluster on Indiana Avenue in the area I was showing you images of earlier. Um, but the other three that might be of interest to you is um, this first one sort of near Mass Ave. That's Renaissance Place and Riley Towers. Um, so you all probably know Renaissance Place is like that sort of weird, they're like duplex and like quadplex sort of suburban looking homes like right off Mass Ave, that's that area. And then this next one, a little bit north, is the Kennedy King neighborhood, which we, you know, we've seen mass demolitions over there and lots of new houses. And then up to the north, um, just to the east of Douglas Park, was the last of the urban renewal sites. So here I've mapped the sites on top of the redlining map that I showed you earlier, and five of the six urban renewal sites are redlined. And then the last one, which is the one with Kennedy King, was in the yellow, definitely declining area. And I don't think we can ignore that. So I, I think what we 
we continue to see as I play with different maps and I'm going to keep showing maps, but you'll notice with a lot of these maps where policies are happening and where, you know, places are sort of selected tend to be these areas that are either yellow for definitely declining or red for hazardous. So urban renewal happens in the 1940s. Um, I started playing with images of the structures themselves in these redlined areas. Um, this is for the Renaissance Place area. This is section D9, so just north of Mass Ave. And I'm showing you an image of some apartment buildings. Very, very cute, um, you know, nice apartment buildings that get demolished for what becomes Renaissance Place. And I started thinking, you know, maybe some of this, um, maybe some of the analysis the HOLC does on the buildings themselves is kind of bogus. Um, I think we have to consider the, the time frame, which is this is, this is a few decades before the historic preservation movement really takes over. Um, this is before the National Historic Preservation Act, the 1960s. Um, so I think a lot of people had this mentality that like buildings have a shelf life. Um, but today, you know, we would probably find a way to like restore and, and rehab these kind of structures. Um, so that's just, that's just me sort of on my soapbox from a historic preservation side of things. But let's jump ahead a couple years. So now let's move into the 1950s. And so now we're seeing um, redlining has happened, urban renewal projects have happened, what's happening downtown in some of these, you know, most devalued areas. So this is showing you um, Indiana Avenue looking north in that picture from the left, you can see Walker Theater like just in the background. And on the right, you're looking south down the avenue and you can see the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in the circle. So here we're still seeing the dense and intact commercial corridor that I pointed out earlier, um, but I think we're beginning to see um, sort of the initial consequences of these policies that have been around now for two decades. Um, you can definitely see, you know, there's some deferred maintenance, right? Um, and we're not seeing any new development like we're seeing in other sides of town. Look at the architecture. It's a lot of brick, you know, sort of 18, 80s to like 1920s kind of brickwork. Um, we're not seeing any new construction, which should be kind of obvious in one sense that like if everything's built up, there's not going to be new structures, but like in a way there's, you know, fires always happen, things always get demolished to be, um, to be rebuilt in other parts of downtown. So I do think, um, thinking about things like development and infrastructure, the fact that we're not seeing any of that um, because the, the area has been, the land has been devalued, right? So no one's going to invest in these areas. We're going to see more of a, a gradual decline. And why would we want to you know, decline land value? Um, I think it's very much connected to highway development. Uh, so in the 1960s, we have the downtown highway system being planned, right? So 465 and then the 6570 loop is getting routed. Um, there are crazy debates about where to put the highway. I can send you some very lengthy documents. Um, there's some great stuff that's digitized from a, a Purdue master's student who like wrote a five book thesis on highway planning it's insan insanity how they um, sort of are routing and rerouting and moving, you know, a mile of the highway to save this house or, or that house. But this is what we end up with. And if you overlay the highway map on the redlining map, I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? It's almost entirely going through the red hazardous and the yellow definitely declining areas. Um, you see a little bit jogging through the blue on the south side um, on the edge of the Garfield Park neighborhood and that Jaga 65 is really fascinating um, to see the debate where they wanted to connect 65 to 465. Um, so that's the south side definitely takes a little bit more of a beating in that way. 
Um, but I do think it's important to think about highway planning as sort of a, a sister policy of redlining. So the Federal Highway Act actually goes down in 1956, right? But it takes like a decade of infighting, um, you know, in city government with NDOT to plan the route, to acquire the land, to clear the land, build the highways. Um, so, so this is what we're, we're left with in the late 60s. And I think it's important to consider how the interloop highway system, particularly because that's where, you know, there's established neighborhoods and, and people are living. We, it's still pretty rural in the 465 area. But for that interloop part of the highway system, um, you know, this is really damaging to downtown, to center township neighborhoods, because you're bisecting neighborhoods, you know, you're cutting neighborhoods off of downtown. Uh, I think some of the, the figures in the newspaper are that over 20,000 buildings were demolished and um, 22,000 people were displaced. I actually think that's kind of a conservative estimate and it's, it's not really proven. Um, I think we're going to have to spend more time in the NDOT archives to figure that out. But think about sort of the, the physical and psychological barriers that the highway has. Um, I don't know if that comes up in your work selling homes, but um, it's, you know, it's definitely kind of a, a barrier here in Fountain Square. But there's also like this decline in connectivity and economic development that's happening. Um, so I, I do think that this is sort of that next wave of redlining. You know, first you have urban renewal policy and now we have have this policy and, and that is that is a, a negative um, thing for people who are living in these areas. You know, obviously people need to be able to get downtown and, and how, what's the, the most um, effective way to sort of move from suburbs into downtown, but that's like another program that we don't have time to debate today. Um, here are some aerials of the urban highway of the inner loop. Um, so this is 6570 downtown and that red line is showing you Indiana Avenue um, just to show you how close it is to that sort of northern section of the inner loop um, and uh, you can see all of the the structures and the land that's just completely reconfigured for the highway system and this is um, 1941 and 1979 uh, so where does this lead us a couple decades later? Um, you know, I think that these three policies created layers of disinvestment. Some people leave because they can afford to, you know, they're going to go out to the suburbs as the suburbs are expanding and, and roads are, are going out there. Um, but others stay because, you know, they, they can't afford to leave. Um, they want to be close to work. They, they don't have, they can't afford to leave. So eventually, um, you have all this disinvestment that creates these low land values that it's going to become tempting to others to invest, right? And that's where the gentrification side of this history comes in as like this inevitable next phase that starts with redlining. So I define gentrification as the restoration and redevelopment of homes, businesses, and other amenities in run down or less desired urban areas. And this is accompanied with an influx of middle class or affluent people, um, which results in the displacement of low income residents. And it also changes the cultural character of the neighborhood. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of definitions about of what gentrification is and isn't. Um, I do think that savvy or data repository at the Polis Center does a pretty good job of, of having an inclusive definition of what gentrification is. And that's what this link is to that report that they did looking at neighborhood change from 1970 to 2016. So that's why I'm using their maps here um, to show which sort of sections of downtown they've considered have been gentrified. And starting, um, this is starting in 1990. So it's showing you 1990, 2000, 2010, and 2016. And what do you notice about these clusters? You know, these, the first one in 1990, um, I would say that 
it's mostly redlined areas and at least four if not five of the urban renewal sites are sort of captured already in that gentrified area and then it's just expanding um, each decade. So again, uh, this is showing you more of a, a pictorial kind of documentation of this. Um, here is along the avenue <coughs> on IUPUI's campus. Um, to the left, we have, you know, vernacular, single family homes, uh, but you guys probably sell this, these kind of homes all the time in, um, you know, Lockerbie or Fletcher Place, like, you know, you've seen homes like this but they, they don't get saved, you know, they're demolished for Lockfield, which on the right is a picture of half of Lockfield getting demolished just 50 years later. Um, we can look at sort of off the avenue on the north side. Um, on the left, we have other similar kind of, um, you know, wood-sided vernacular workers' homes right on the canal, like, right on the canal. They all get demolished. Now we have this this new sort of canal as an amenity, but before that it was like a trench for 150 years. It was just a giant trench. And then sort of on the southern end of the avenue, um, here on the left are some really, um, really remarkable structures that were probably built, you know, just after the Civil War, you know, probably 1870s, you know, brick Italianate structure. Um, they get demolished, and then you can see just a few years later, the picture on the right, we're seeing sort of that southern terminus of the avenue. We've got lots of parking lots, we've got lots of empty spaces, and now we have the AUL building, which I think in a lot of ways, the, the position of the tower you know, you can't see the monument anymore off of Indiana Avenue. Like, it's sort of like that building is turning its back on the avenue. Like, I think there's kind of a gesture there. So where does all of this lead us? Um, all of these policies have an effect, right? Um, we're going to get into questions of displacement when we're thinking about today's housing market and how things are redeveloped. Um, I would consider displacement occurs when, you know, residents can no longer afford to remain in their homes due to rising rents or property taxes. Uh, residents are forced out due to eminent domain, drop leases, evictions, you know, conditions that render their homes uninhabitable. They are discriminated against um, changes in land use or zoning. So looking at that kind of displacement, I think we need to talk a lot about, you know, the the upcoming eviction crisis. And um, so I decided to map some of the eviction lab data on the redlining maps. Um, so here's the link if you wanna play with the data yourself because I do think it's important to know, you know, Indy's eviction rate is, is much higher than the national average. There's, there's something going on that's, that's wrong going on here. Um, so I put the mapping, the eviction data on top of the redlining map and um, this map's a little hard to read. So the larger the dot, that means the more evictions for that area. Um, so you can see, um, obviously, this uh, eviction map includes areas that weren't part of the city boundaries in the 1930s. So that's all the areas that don't have that redlining map behind it. Um, but in areas that are devalued, yellow and red, you have a lot of large circles. And then if you look in some of the green and blue areas, they tend to be smaller circles, particularly that northern corridor, um, kind of going up from Butler Tarkington, kind of up, up through the Holiday Park area. And so I, I think that, you know, we can't dismiss all of these connections to sort of the land and the value um, that is placed on the land. And then this continues with other contemporary policy. Um, so here we're looking at um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 that you probably all know more as just opportunity zones. Um, so this is showing the opportunity zone map on top of the redlining map. And it's predominantly in the devalued yellow and red areas, right? So 
I think look, thinking about eviction rates and you know, opportunity zone policy, um, we can sort of see this 80 plus year legacy of, of planning and redevelopment projects um, that are leading us to the displacement and, and disinvestment that we're experiencing, particularly in center township, like particularly in these, these close to downtown neighborhoods. Um, and then you think about our infrastructure issues and our quality of life issues. Um, so the Opportunity Zone legislation, um, if you don't know, I think at the beginning people were sort of like, we just need to know more. Tell us more. How does it work? Um, but there was, there's a lot of harsh critique out there about it. And I, I think more and more, the more we learn and the more we, we don't know about certain components of it, I think, I think there's a lot of suspicion around it. Um, you know, is it predatory in nature? Um, does it serve the communities or does it serve the investors who are putting their capital gains um, money in there? It's, you know, that's a question for, lots of people will have different answers, but I'm, I'm sort of looking at it from more of a historical context of just like, look at the places it's, it's claiming to serve. And if, you know, these areas have a, a track record of being underserved, um, how, how is this gonna work for the, the people that live there today? So another um, contemporary policy that's going on right now on the local level is the LISC, um, LISC Great Places 2020. So that was a strategy to sort of reinvest, um, you know, looking at things like businesses and, and commercial facades and infrastructure in neighborhoods that really needed investment. So the LISC Great Places 2020 are the five neighborhoods that are the dots I put on this map. And um, this is one of the first maps I made, but it's showing four of the five neighborhoods that LISC selected are formerly redlined. And I think that that's another great example of showing like, yes, 80 years of disinvestment and you know, devaluing land has a negative effect that now we have to deal with today. And now we have to have these policies and plans like Great Places 2020, which are going to, you know, hopefully reinvest in these areas. But um, I think it's just showing sort of like that cause and effect. Um, so what's, what's next? Um, there's still so much work to be done and so much scholarship to be done on the issue. Um, here's a few places to get started. I've included um, the Belt Publishing text that's going to be released in May, but it, it's available for pre-order now. It's the Indianapolis Anthology, which is coming out for the Bicentennial. So Dr. Paul Mullins and I wrote an article about Indiana Avenue and um, sort of challenging the, the narrative of um, of entertainment and music and thinking about um, different forms of entertainment that existed for many, many decades on the avenue. I've also included my friend um, Wild Style Pichelle's article from New America that you can access today online, um, The Ethnic Cleansing of Black Indianapolis. I think that's a really powerful piece if you want to learn more. I've also included a link to uh, the Indianapolis Bicentennial Digital Collections that I've been working on for about a year and a half now. Um, particularly, probably the most important photo collection that I've worked on that would help you all with your work is we got the Department of Metropolitan Development photo archive, which had been just locked away in filing cabinets for decades and decades. Um, so it's showing you areas of downtown prior to, you know, IHPC or just regular historic designation status, um, areas of downtown prior to redevelopment, prior to demolition. Um, this is an amazing photo collection. So you might see um, some street scenes or intersections or, or photos of neighborhoods that you work in a lot um, from like the 1960s to 1990s. And then I've also included uh, the map indie portal, that's where you can access all of the Sanborn and base maps yourself if you're interested in learning more about those and also historic aerial maps. And then the last link is to the redlining map. So you can um, click around to look at Indianapolis or other cities, all the cities that were redlined by the HLC 
are available at that portal. Um, so you can look at the maps and then when you click, the map is interactive, so you can click on each district to pull up those area forms if you're really interested in a certain neighborhood and you want to learn more about sort of why it was devalued or what sort of the stats were for that neighborhood in the 1930s, you can do that from the area forms. You know, the city will be shaped by all these historic moments around us today. Um, I think about the 2020 pandemic and police brutality and racial inequality, our national housing and eviction crisis. Um, you know, this all stems from historic policies. And our city is definitely a stage of these, you know, intentionally inequitable design choices. And like, how, how can we move forward and how can we learn from it if we don't understand the past and how we got here? So if you want to learn more about redlining, um, we had a four-part redlining program series that we started for the Bicentennial. Um, the first part is available on YouTube. I've included the link here, but I can send all these links to Rosie today if you'd like. Um, so the first part was a uh, more of like a national discussion to like set the context for what redlining is um, with one of my favorite sort of architectural historians, um, Dr. Nathan Connolly, who wrote uh, the book about Miami and redlining and segregation. Um, so he did a lecture and we had a moderated discussion um, so that link is available. And then part two um, was really a panel discussion trying to set it into Indianapolis context. So like, how do we make it local? How do we talk about history and demographics and community memory? Um, so that is available on our Facebook stream. Um, I didn't update the slide, so I apologize. Uh, part three just happened a week and a half ago. So I can actually send you that Facebook stream as well, um, which was about developing the city. So like now, now that the audience understands sort of the local context, um, we brought in, I brought in some of my favorite um, urban planners and architects and transit advocates to talk about how they are frustrated by redlining in their everyday work, how it still kind of comes up and is this barrier as they're trying to do all of their amazing projects today. You know, they're still dealing with that impact. Um, so we just had that talk, but part four is coming up next week. And I think a lot of you may actually um, find it interesting because it's about creating equity today. And we have, um, we have local, real estate and mortgage lenders who are in the trenches who are like very aware of what redlining has done and they they want to fight it and they're fighting the good fight and then we also have um the director of the fair housing center for central indiana and you know they're they're on top of all of the the legal issues you know they're watching all of the banks that um are tied up in in discrimination lawsuits related to you know, unfair lending practices today. So I think between the three of them, it's going to be an amazing uh, panel. It's free. You know, I, I, I would never have a program series about inequity that you would have to pay for. Like, that's ridiculous. Um, so they're all free. So you can sign up today um, through our website. It's also part of Spirit in Place Festival. And then in tandem with that, because uh, I don't have enough to do. I had said yes to um, Garfield Park Art Center is doing a talk about historic Indianapolis parks as part of Spirit and Place Fest. So if you're interested in learning more about redlining in land use and parkland, um, I took a lot of those maps that I showed you today and I started playing with um, the Kessler Parks and Boulevard system plan and then historic Indianapolis parks and I started mapping stuff and you know of course it's going to be the same kind of trends that we've been talking about today um, but I'll be sharing that data for the first time publicly this Friday um, so here's a little bit of info for that you can sign up through the Garfield Parks Art Center page through Spirit in Place um, I think they have a Facebook event for it now and that will also be a virtual program and it's also free um, so as we wrap up, 
I have included my Gmail address at the bottom of this slide and also my Twitter handle. Um, I'm going to be fun employed or unemployed in about seven weeks. Um, so don't use my work email because it's not going to work much longer. Uh, but if you want to get a hold of me, you can try my, my Gmail address or just tweet at me. You know, if you have questions about a house, you know, if you're, you want to know more about the history of a cool house you're, you're looking at, um, just let me know and, and I'm happy to help. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see if there are any questions. Oh, we got an active chat. Sorry, I couldn't see the chat when I had my screen share up. Uh, are these pieces side by side in the exhibit too? Yes, they are. Um, we have, I think the uh, copy of the blueprint is up next to it. Uh, the parallelogram is Ransom Place. Yes, that is true. Um, oh, and I don't know when that was digitized. Whoever... The DMD. Uh, oh. Yes, um, so we put it up, I would say about 70% of the collection um, got up by March of this year. So that's like a fresh collection. Um, it is incredible. I'm hoping to get the remaining 30% of it up before I'm terminated. <laughs> we'll see. You might have to like some sad non-architectural historian might have to put it up. I don't know how it's gonna shake up, but that's like one of the collections that I go to bed worrying about every night. Um, one of the coolest things in that collection is actually this like 1976 film roll that's like downtown Indianapolis housing market. Like who's buying? And it's like really offensive guys. Like you would you would get a kick out of it just because it's it's all about that single family home, suburban, like white business daddy, like stay at home mom. Like it's just like this is the 1970s guys. Um, so I, I got it digitized and we're having some copyright debates about if it can go up or not, but if it can, like you should have a screening of that because it's just like, this is what the city was still kind of like valuing at the time. It's, it's nuts, but the DMD collection is, is probably the most valuable thing for your work, but also for just architectural historians in general in Indianapolis, I think, that collection is kind of a, a jackpot. And you guys take volunteers in, in 95 masks to help with digitization? Yeah, you know, I think um, with the massive layoffs that are coming, we're going to need a lot of volunteers at the History Center. Um, I don't know what that's going to shape up to look like. It's, it's a very weird time to be working in the history realm. Um, yeah. But yeah, we, you know, we always use volunteers for, for research, for transcriptions, um, lots of things, lots of cool things in the library. Jordan, thank you so much. Um, yeah. yeah, also, I'm really sad that, uh, as you put it, you're about to be fun employed. You um, know, it gives me time to like work on all my side projects. Like I've been thinking a lot about um, like sex work and like the the sort of bordello industry in in Indianapolis in the 1870s 1890s there's there's great articles about it and like now I can just do like all these weird random history like <laughs> I've had, like I, I don't think I'll be bored um you know I'll I'll find another job where I won't and then I'll just like go to law school or something and and like battle you know racial covenants and you know like it'll all it'll all work out no matter what um yeah. So yeah, feel free to to contact me for my Gmail or you know, Tad knows how to get a hold of me. So you can always display <laughs> thanks. Um, and otherwise, I'll send I'll compile all the links from the slides and I'll send them to Rosie so she can distribute them out to all of you. That's great. Jordan, right. thanks. And um, guys, thanks for joining. I think um, I designed this training series to have a lot of things uh, or a lot of training around um, racism and real estate practices because uh, our industry has a really atrocious past um, and uh, we want to learn how to be better. So um, thanks for joining and have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow. Adios. Bye everyone. Bye.
I'll email you in a couple hours, Rosie. Is that okay? All right. Thanks. Bye.